I'm Louise. I'm Anna. I'm Nadia. Our molecule is isoprene when polymerized is commonly referred to as rubber. It, rubber has changed our world dramatically. It is commonly referred to as the second greatest feat of engineering in the 20th century. Second only to the atomic bomb. The oldest use of rubber was between 1600 and 1200 BC in Veracruz, Mexico. Christopher Columbus was the first person to record the use of rubber and it was during his travels to the Americas in 1495. He witnessed natives playing a game with molded balls of plant gum. He, re he realized that the substance was more practical for game use than animal bladders. He decided to bring samples back to Europe and there they became a novelty item. Rubber was a fascinating new substance and people all over the world wanted to try it out, especially in Europe. In 1823, a man named Charles McIntosh figured out a way to make a huge profit off of the rubber craze. He created waterproof coats. Everyone bought one but soon realized it wasn't as perfect as they thought. In hot weather, the coats melted and in cold weather, they became brittle and crumbled apart. As stated in the book, Napoleon's Buttons, the rubber fever was over almost as soon as it began. Go. These are the two different forms of isoprene, the cis form and the trans form. These are the formulas and the structure. The only difference is that these two molecules switch, but this causes a dramatic change when they polymerize. This is the cis form polymerized and this is the trans. In the cis, there's not that many crosslinks and it's a very irregular formation, so when tension is applied, they can easily slip past each other and stretch. But in the transform, there's many crosslinks and it's very straight, so even when tension is applied, it cannot stretch as well. According to chemicalbook.com, isoprene is extremely flammable. It is very unstable and known to spontaneous polymerization. It is incompatible with strong oxidizing agents. Pure elemental isoprene is unstable and bonds easily, especially in the synthesis reactions. For example, it only takes a little heat for it to bond with sulfur. So after rubber fever, a lot of people didn't see the potential, but Charles Goodyear was one who did. He, in one of his experiments, he added rubber to sulfur and added heat and he got a rubber that was suitable in all weather climates. So the process that Charles Goodyear discovered is now referred to as vulcanization. Um, this is basically when you add natural rubber that is pure in its cis form to disulfide powder and it's heated, which then creates, um, it causes the sulfur atoms to bond with the isoprene molecules. And this creates um, crosslinks, as you can see right here, here, and here. Um, usually, the problem with the natural rubber was that um, in the hot weather, it would be too stretchy and it would fall apart and melt into like useless goop. And in the winter, it would become like hard and really brittle, and it would just break. So it would, um, without enough crosslinks, the Polymers would like slip past each other, so when you add the sulfur um, atoms in there, it creates a good stretch that the rubber is still strong. Once there was an option to vulcanize rubber, it could be made into almost anything. The Amazon capitalists took over the parts of the rainforest that contain rubber plants. They called them rubber plantations. Once the rubber was harvested and vulcanized, it was formed into large lumps and sent down the stream to the city of Manaus. The city's wealth was attributed solely to the location, for the basin was the only place in the world that had the trees to make rubber on this large scale.
As the demand for rubber went up, it was hard for the suppliers in the Amazon basin to keep up with it. They discovered that by cutting down a tree, up to 100 pounds of latex could be harvested, rather than the usual three pounds per tree. This started to deplete the rainforest, and the Hevia trees were on the verge of extinction. But according to scienceandsociety.co.uk, a British man named Henry Wickham collected rubber tree seeds and sent them back to Europe, where he nurtured them. They grew into saplings and were sent to Sri Lanka, where they created new plantations. Now rubber was completely accessible to the entire world. During World War I, America's rubber supply ran dangerously low. FDR made a special committee just to find an alternative supply of rubber. This committee stated that if we fail to secure quickly a large rubber supply, our war effort and domestic economy will both fail. And thus the search began. When the Allies blockaded Germany's rubber supply, they began to make synthetic rubber, the best one being styrene butanine rubber, or SBR. This was three parts butanine and one part styrene. America got hold of this groundbreaking research when in 1929 the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey made a deal with IG Farben, the German company, for synthetic oil in exchange for the supposedly useless synthetic rubber formulas. This started the American synthetic rubber <laughs> production boom. Artificial rubber is like plastic. It takes hundreds of years to decompose. Styrofoam is especially bad. This causes major problems with pollution, especially in the ocean. There are places around the world where trash collects and it is an extreme danger to wildlife.